Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Now, Paul is going to get into the subject here, of which will take up most of the chapter in just a few minutes, and that subject is the resurrection, both Jesus' resurrection and our own resurrection. But before getting into it, he wants to talk about the place of the resurrection in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, Paul begins by simply saying in verse 1 of chapter 15, the gospel which I preach to you. Now, in verses 3 and 4, he's going to describe that gospel to us. He's going to give us what the content of the gospel is. But here, he only describes how we benefit by the gospel. Notice what he says here in verses 1 and 2. He says, the gospel which I preach to you, right? That's how the gospel begins. Somebody preaches, presents the gospel to you. Then it says next in verse 1, which also you received and in which you stand. The gospel is only of benefit if it's received and if one will stand in it. Now, do you know what the word gospel means? It simply means good news. That's what the word means in the original language of the New Testament. And as the word was used in ancient times, it didn't necessarily describe religious news or the news about Jesus Christ. You know, if you were following the ancient chariot races and you had a big bet on chariot number five and it came in first and somebody came and told you, chariot number five's a winner, you'd say, that's gospel, baby. That's good news. It was just a word used for good news. But when it comes into the Christian context of the context of the New Testament, my friends, what could be better news than to know that we can be saved from the punishment that we deserve from God because of what Jesus Christ did for us? Is there any better news? That's why we associate the term gospel with the essential message of Christianity. Now, I want you to notice this, that the Corinthian Christians first received the gospel. Did you see that in verse 1? He says, which you received. The gospel message must first be believed and embraced. Friends, that's a challenging question for everybody here. Have you believed, have you embraced the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you embraced what that good news is? You might say, I don't know what the good news is. It's funny, what so many churches today are presenting is not good news. What so many churches are presenting, uh, first of all, they start off by presenting, maybe you go to the first church of the big list of rules, right? And uh, that's not good news. You know, do this, 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 and maybe someday you'll be good enough to be saved. Friends, that's not good news. Then you go to the other church, and it's the the first church of uh, how to find yourself. Can I tell you, that's not good news. You search all around, you look all your life, you try to find yourself, and once you found it, what do you got? You got yourself. That's no bargain, friends. You know, and then you got the first church of what's happening or the first church of the entertainment or the first. It's all none of it's good news. Good news. What is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, that message Paul's going to describe in just a a few minutes. But I want you to see here also uh, what he says here at the end of verse one. Not only did the Corinthian Christians receive the gospel, they stood in it. Now, I say this much to the credit of the Corinthian Christians. You know me, as we've been going through this letter of 1 Corinthians, I've been on the let's bash the Corinthians bandwagon, haven't I? And it's hard not to be on that bandwagon as you go through it. They're, they're carnal. They're, they're having a lack of understanding. There's strife. There's divisions. There's immorality. There's weird spirituality. There's all sorts of weird things going on in the Corinthian church. But let's give them credit for this. They're standing in the gospel. Isn't that praiseworthy? I mean, for as much else as they got going on wrong, they're standing in the gospel. And you take the Galatian church that Paul wrote to, uh, you read Galatians chapter 1, and Paul says, I'm amazed that so quickly you're departing from the gospel which I preached to you. The Corinthians weren't like that. Hey, for all of their problems, at least they were standing in the essential message of Jesus Christ. And it's a good thing they were, because notice it in verse 2, by which, in other words, by this gospel... Also, you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preach to you. 
Now, the Corinthian Christians had done well in receiving the gospel, right? That's great. They were doing well right now because they were standing on the gospel. That's past. I hope every one of you in the past have received the gospel. I hope every one of you right now are standing in the gospel. You need that as well. But friends, what about the future? Are you going to hold fast the gospel that the Apostle Paul preached? Every Christian must take seriously their responsibility, not just to have a good past and a good present. Friends, you need to do everything you can before the Lord God helping you to have a good future of holding fast onto Jesus Christ. And let me say this also, when Paul says in verse 2 that they had to hold fast, it also implies that there's some people or some things which might want to snatch the true gospel away from the Corinthian Christians. Are you aware of that in your life? There's some things in your life that want to snatch away the true gospel. Maybe it's deception. Maybe it's carnality. Maybe it's just being distracted with the things of the world. Maybe it's just plain old naked pride and self-centeredness. But friends, there's things in your life that if you let them, they will snatch away the gospel from you. That's why you need to hold fast. And if you don't hold fast, what's the danger? Look at it there in verse 2. By which you are also saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached you, unless you believed in vain. My friends, wouldn't that be a horrible thing to say at the end of your life? How about having that inscribed on your tombstone? Believed in vain. Oh yeah, they believed in Jesus Christ at one time. But look at them through the years, through the slow drift of time. They drifted away from Jesus until the end of their life. They weren't holding on to the gospel of Jesus Christ at all. They had turned their back on it a long time ago, though in a subtle way. And at the end of it all, they had believed in vain. And friends, let me tell you something. If you let go of the gospel, all of your previous belief won't do you any good. It will be as if you had believed in vain. Oh yeah, but I really loved God when I was a teenager. Oh no, you should have seen me in that college and career group in my 20s. Oh no, as a young married, oh boy, I was there. Friends, all of that in the past, it's wiped away. It was all in vain. You need to hold on and hold fast to the very end. Now, what is it that we have to hold fast on to? What's the content of the good news? Good news, Paul says. Well, what is the good news? This may surprise you. Look at verses 3 and 4. Here's the good news. Here is the gospel. You want to know what the gospel is? You circle this in your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. This is the gospel. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. My friends, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, what? That? Wait wait a minute, This, this doesn't tell me how to erase all my problems and how to be rich. This doesn't tell me how to, you know, just have a wonderful life with everybody. I don't see what's so good about this. My friends, this is the gospel. I want you to see how Paul says it. First of all, in verse 3, he points out that he delivered to the Corinthians this gospel, which he had received. Paul did not make up this gospel. He received it. This gospel didn't begin with Paul. It's not like Paul took a big marketing survey and decided, I need a message that people are going to enjoy, that people are going to latch on to. What do they want to hear? This message didn't originate with Paul. He received it. It was not Paul's gospel in the sense that he created it or fashioned it. It was Paul's gospel in the sense that he personally believed it and he personally spread it. Friends, the preacher does not make the gospel. And if the preacher does make the gospel, it's not worth having. Let me tell you what you do not want. You do not want an original preacher. Oh, it might be fine if he says the same old gospel truths, maybe with a new turn of phrase that, that just strikes your ear a little bit better. But baby, if it's, if it's originality when it comes to doctrine, if it's originality when it comes to the statement of purpose, then friends, we don't want any part of it. It's my intention not to sing, teach a single new doctrine my entire life. I just want to teach what the apostles taught. And beware, you know, and when it's, oh, I've never heard anything like that before. Uh, my ears go, whoa, careful now. Maybe you never heard anything like that before because it's not the truth of the gospel. Paul received it and he delivered it. And then he goes on to state what the gospel is. Now, I want you to notice something. I read through it, but did you notice this when I read through it? 
The gospel is not insightful teaching. The gospel is not good advice. The gospel is not do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's not the gospel, my friends. The gospel is not, can't we all get along? (laughs) The gospel is not, uh, you know, love one another. No, some of those things are true, and some of those things are commandments for Christians. But friends, they in and of themselves are not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to see that the gospel describes things which happened. Actual, real, historical events. The gospel is not a matter of religious opinions, of platitudes, or of fairy tales. The gospel is all about real historical events. I've gone, what, about 10 minutes and nothing from Spurgeon yet. Well, here we go. He says, our, <laughs> quote, our religion is not based upon opinions, but upon facts. We hear persons sometimes saying, those are your views and these are ours. Whatever your views may be is a small matter. What are the facts of the case? And that's what the gospel is all about, friend. It's not about your opinion, my opinion, Paul's opinion, anybody else's opinion. What the gospel is all about is historical events. And do you see what the first historical event is? He says it there in verse 3, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's the first aspect of the gospel. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Friends, the death of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, is the center of the gospel. Now, the idea of glorying in the death of a Savior is foolishness to the world. Think about it. I've got great news about my Savior. He was executed by the government. That's good news? It seems foolish, doesn't it? But friends, it's salvation to those who will believe. Jesus Christ died. Now, Paul doesn't mention how he died, but you know how Jesus died, don't you? Jesus died at the hands of the Roman government through one of the most cruel and excruciating forms of capital punishment ever devised, the crucifixion. Now, friends, the Romans did not invent crucifixion, but they perfected it. What crucifixion was all about was it was a way to kill a person slowly and painfully and publicly. That's what crucifixion was all about. Now, in the days the New Testament was first written, you didn't have to explain what crucifixion was about. Everybody knew. But we might do well to appreciate just what happened when someone was crucified. You see, first, before the actual crucifixion, the victim's back would be torn open by what they called the scourging that was being whipped with a cat of nine tails that had glass or metal or bone embedded on it. And they would strike the person at the top of the back and then drag the metal implements down across their back and basically just rip open the flesh of their back. Well, after that, they would put the clothes back on the person. When they came to the place of crucifixion, they would rip the clothes off. The blood would have clotted somewhat on the person's back. Then they would have had it ripped open again. Then they would be thrown to the ground and nailed through the wrist to the cross beam. The wounds on the back would again be torn open and contaminated with dirt. As the victim hung on the cross... With each breath, they would have to sort of push themselves up up from their knees, uh, uh, flexing from their thighs to get a decent breath. And as they did this, the huge open wound on their back would rub against the rough wood of the cross, causing intense pain. When the nail would be driven through the wrist, it would sever what's called the large median nerve. This stimulated nerve would produce excruciating bolts of fiery pain in both arms. And it would result in that kind of claw-like grip in each one of the victim's hands. But friends, beyond the excruciating pain in the back from the nail wounds, just from the exposure, The main element of crucifixion was that it inhibited somebody's normal breathing. The the weight of the body pulling down on the arms and the shoulders would tend to fix your breathing muscles in an inhalation state, and it would hinder your ability to exhale. 
So this lack of adequate breathing would result in real muscle cramps, and those would even hinder your breathing further. To, to get a good breath, you'd have to push against your feet. Remember, your feet are nailed to this cross. You'd have to push against the feet, flex your elbows, and pull from the shoulders. When you put weight on your feet, it would make searing pain in your feet, and the flexing of the elbows would twist your arms and the hands hanging on the nails. You'd scrape your back, open wound, against the cross just to give it a breath. Friends, each breath when you were on the cross would be agonizing and exhausting. And sometimes people hung on crosses for days until they were finally dead. You see, as you hung on the cross, insects would come upon you and just start digging into your flesh. You wouldn't be able to brush them away from your eyes, your ears, your nose. Birds of prey would come and sit on you and pick away at your flesh. And most of the time, they would just leave the body on the cross and let it be devoured by wild animals. Now, when you're on a cross, the actual death would come from many sources. Sometimes people would die from acute shock from the massive blood loss. Sometimes they would be too exhausted to breathe any longer and they would just suffocate. Oftentimes in crucifixion, they died from dehydration or from a stress-induced heart attack or congestive heart failure leading to a cardiac rupture. If the victim didn't die quickly enough, sometimes they would break the legs and then the victim would soon be unable to breathe because they couldn't push themselves up from the legs. How bad was crucifixion? We get our English word excruciating from the Roman word out of the cross. Simply put, it was excruciating. Now, friends, however, when we talk about the sufferings of Jesus on the cross, I don't want anybody here to sit here and listen to that and feel sorry for Jesus. Nobody should be here and feel sorry for Jesus as if he needed our pity. My friends, save your pity for those who reject the complete work of Jesus on the cross at Calvary. Save your pity for those preachers who don't have the wisdom or the courage or the heart of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where he proclaimed the center of the Christian message, we preach Christ crucified. Those are the ones who deserve your pity, not the triumphant Jesus on the cross. Now I want you to notice this in verse 3. Not only does it say that Jesus Christ died, right? That could be enough. But it says that he died for our sins. What does it mean that Jesus died for our sins? How does his death do anything for our sins? Friends, look, let's be upfront about it. Many noble men and women have died throughout the centuries, and many of them have died horrible deaths for righteous causes. How is the death of Jesus any different? How does his death do anything for our sins? Friends, it's simply put this way. At some point before Jesus died, before the veil in the temple was torn in two, before he cried out, it is finished, an awesome spiritual transaction took place. The Father laid upon the Son all of the guilt, all of the wrath that our sin deserved. And Jesus bore that guilt and wrath in himself, satisfying it perfectly, totally satisfying the wrath of God on our behalf. Friends, as horrible as the physical suffering of Jesus Christ was, and we will agree it was horrible, as bad as the physical suffering was, this spiritual suffering, this act of being judged for sin in our place, this is what Jesus really dreaded about the cross. Friends, when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane and begged God the Father, if there be any way that this cup could pass from me, the cup in the Old Testament was a picture of the wrath of God being given to his enemies. And Jesus said, I don't want to be regarded as your enemy. I don't want to be served your wrath. But friends, on the cross, Jesus became, as it were, an enemy of God. And he was forced and, and judged and, and made to drink the cup of the Father's fury. Why? So that we would not have to drink that cup. Isaiah chapter 53 puts it powerfully. Let me read it to you. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. 
He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. And friends, when that spiritual transaction took place, when God the Father put the judgment upon God the Son that we righteously deserved, once that was completely satisfied before the throne of God, and we have no idea how long it took. This is one of the mysteries of heaven. It could have taken a moment. It could have taken 10 minutes. It could have taken an hour. We don't know how long it took to accomplish that spiritual transaction. But the moment it was finished, Jesus said, I don't need to hang around here anymore. He said, it's finished. And he gave up his spirit to the Father in heaven. There was no reason for him to pardon the sin, to hang around on the cross. His work was done. He could go on now. Friends, Jesus Christ, the essential element of the gospel is that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And let's put it that way. Our sins put Jesus on the cross. Jesus Christ did not die for a political cause. He did not die as an enemy of the state, nor did he die for somebody's envy. Sometimes to the great shame of the church, the Jewish people have been persecuted and have been uh, just put down with the, with the derisive term Christ killers. Friends, let me tell you something. Every morning when I wake up, I look in the mirror and I look at a Christ killer. Because it was my sin that put Jesus on the cross. And it was your sin. He died for our sins. He didn't die as some martyr for a cause or a victim of circumstance. He died to save us from our sins. But that's not the only aspect of the gospel. Yes, he died for our sins, but look at it in verse 4. And that he was buried. Now, we don't often think of the burial of Jesus as part of the gospel, do we? But it is. Do you know why the burial of Jesus is important? Well, first of all, it is proof positive that he actually died. You don't bury somebody unless they're dead. <laughs> Pretty simple, right? Jesus' death was confirmed at the cross before they even took him down to be buried. But the burial of Jesus is important for another reason. Because it fulfilled the scriptures which declared, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Jesus was buried in the tomb of a rich man. And it fulfilled the scriptures. The gospel is that Jesus died, was buried, and then look at the third item in verse 4. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He rose again, my friends. Now, this is the point Paul's really been waiting to get at. This truth is essential to the gospel. Now, I think this is important for us to consider. Why, if it's Jesus' death on the cross that paid for our sins and removed our guilt, right? We all agree it was his work on the cross. Then why is the resurrection of Jesus so important? You know, some people think that you know, the resurrection is just kind of an add-on. That the real work was done on the cross, and, you know, resurrection is nice, good for Jesus. I mean, it helped him out. But how is that essential to the gospel? Now, friends, please understand, the resurrection is absolutely essential to the gospel of Jesus Christ, because although Jesus bore the full wrath of God on the cross as if he were a sinner, as if he were guilty of all of our sin, even being made sin for us, Jesus Christ himself did not actually become a sinner. He bore the guilt of our sin, but he did not become a sinner. You see, even the act of taking our sin was an act of holy giving love for us. So that Jesus himself did not become a sinner, even though he bore the full guilt of our sin. And friends, that's a gospel message. That Jesus took our punishment for sin on the cross and remained a perfect Savior throughout the whole ordeal, that is proved by his resurrection. Let me put it to you this way. The resurrection of Jesus is not some add-on to the more important work of the cross. If the cross is the payment for our sin, then the empty tomb is the receipt. 
And friends, what good's the payment if you don't have the receipt? You got to have the receipt, right? You got to have some evidence that the price was paid. And friends, it's the receipt showing that the perfect son of God made perfect payment for our sins. The payment itself is a little good without the receipt. And this is why the resurrection of Jesus was such a prominent theme in the evangelistic preaching of the early church. Friends, the cross was a time of victorious death. It was a negative triumph. Sin was defeated, but at the cross, nothing positive was put in place of sin. That waited until the resurrection. At the resurrection, Jesus showed that he didn't uh, fall under the inevitable result of sin. The resurrection proves that Jesus Christ is a victor, that he's a conqueror. And so what did he do? Look at what the gospel says. He rose again, and he rose again the third day. Now, the fact that Jesus rose again the third day is part of the gospel. Friends, if he would have rose again the second day, or the fourth day, or the fifth day, or a week later, it wouldn't have been right. It wouldn't have worked. Do you know why? Well, because he said he would. Jesus said he would rise again the third day. And if he didn't rise again the third day, he would have been a hypocrite. He would have been a false prophet. And he did it all according to the scriptures. Friends, we could spend a lot of time this evening going through the the places where it talks about the death, the resurrection, the burial of Jesus Christ, and as it's foretold in the Old Testament. Let me just say it's important to point out that none of this was like some new plan that God had. He foretold it all. Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day, all according to the scriptures. Friends, that is the gospel message. Now, do you see how important it is to bring people to the gospel? To tell people how their sins can be taken care of because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Friends, that's preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel is not inviting somebody to church. I'm not saying it's bad to invite somebody to church, but you haven't preached the gospel to them. Preaching the gospel is telling people what Jesus Christ did for them to take care of their sin problem. It's talking about what Jesus did, not what they have to do. Telling somebody else what they have to do, that's not the gospel. The gospel is telling other people what Jesus did for them. Now, Paul has been bringing this up mainly because he wants to get at this issue of the resurrection. So now, beginning at verse 5, he's going to talk about evidence of the resurrection. Well, let me just read this to you, verses 5 through 8. He says, And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. And after that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. What Paul is doing is he's calling forth the witnesses to the resurrection. You know, a lot of people were witnesses to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, let's remember that nobody saw the actual resurrection of Jesus. No one was present in the tomb when his body transformed into a resurrection body. And I don't know what they would have seen if they would have been there at the time. Maybe there would have been a brilliant flash of light and they would have seen the dead body of Jesus transformed and virtually vaporized out of the grave clothes. Perhaps it would have been, and I I hope I'm not using an offensive picture here, but perhaps it would have been something along the lines the way a body was transported on the old Star Trek series. You know, on the transporter or whatever they call it. You know, the, 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 the molecules just kind of fuzz up up and then they, they rematerialize somewhere. We know that Jesus could pass through a solid object in his resurrection body, and he could, I guess, reassemble himself into a solid person. And we know Jesus could do that, and he could miraculously appear in a room that had all the doors locked and windows shut. Yet at the same time, Jesus was no phantom. His resurrection body was not a, a spirit, a ghost, a phantom body. It was real flesh and bone. Friends, the bottom line is this. Nobody saw the actual resurrection of Jesus. But many people saw the resurrected Jesus. And so Paul is now calling forth the witnesses. He says, let's all talk about the witnesses to the resurrection. I want to establish beyond all controversy that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So first of all, he says he was seen by Cephas. Do you know who Cephas is? It's Peter. Now what's interesting about this is, We're not told much about this, but apparently Jesus had a special resurrection appearance to Peter. 
unique, one-on-one. -on -one. And it was early on. I, I kind of think that Jesus met him in a dark room and kind of slapped him around a bit. <laughs> Deny me, did you? No, no, I don't believe that. Way. <laughs> Honestly, friends, we're not told much about that visit, but we can assume that there was some special need for comfort and restoration in Peter's life that Jesus ministered to. You know, later on in John chapter 21, Jesus had a public restoration of Peter. But I think he had a private one between the resurrected Jesus and Peter one-on-one. -on -one. So he says in verse 5, he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. This probably refers to the first meeting Jesus had with his assembled disciples mentioned in Mark chapter 16, Luke chapter 24, and John chapter 20. This is the meeting where Jesus appeared in the room with the doors and the windows shut and where he breathed on the disciples, giving them the Holy Spirit. Now, there is something we have to say there. When Jesus says that he appeared to the twelve, he's speaking metaphorically because there weren't twelve disciples there. Judas had killed himself and Thomas wasn't present there either at this first meeting. But the 12 was just a figure of speech referring to the group of the disciples. So he met with Peter. He met with the 12. Then look at verse 6. It says, after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Then Jesus met with over 500 brethren at once. Now, this meeting is not detailed in the Gospels. It's suggested in Matthew chapter 28. And during the time after his resurrection, but before his ascension, Jesus seemed to meet with his followers on many different occasions. But I want you to notice this. Paul says that Jesus met with more than 500 believers at one time in Galilee, and most of those people were alive at the time Paul was writing. Friends, this is very compelling testimony for the truth of the resurrected Jesus. Paul is saying... Go ask the people who saw the resurrected Jesus. Don't take my word for it. We're not just talking about a handful of self-deluded souls. There are literally hundreds who saw the resurrected Jesus with their own eyes. They know Jesus rose from the dead. Go talk to him. That's what Paul's saying. I need to make this very clear, my friends. Sometimes we sing that song. He lives. He lives. You ask me how, I know he lives. He lives inside my heart. My friends, can I tell you something? That's not good enough. Buddha can live inside your heart. Muhammad can live inside your heart. Joseph Smith can live inside your heart. You want to ask me how I know he lives? I know he lives because historical proof establishes it. It doesn't matter whether I feel it in my heart or not. He lives. If for some reason I stop feeling it in my heart, that doesn't mean that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. You ask me how I know he lives because the evidence proves it. Friends, if we believe anything in history... We can believe the reliable, confirmed testimony of these eyes witnesses, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Friends, how do you know that uh, Julius Caesar ever existed? Well, I read about him in the history. You ever see him? No. You ever see a photograph of him? No. You ever see a movie of him? No. Uh, do you ever talk to you? No. Do you have a tape recording of him? No. How do you know Julius Caesar lived? You know Julius Caesar lived because you have the written account of eyewitnesses to his life. And as you go through and examine those written accounts from the eyewitnesses of his life, it makes sense, right? Uh, he went up to what's modern-day France. He fought a lot of wars with the barbarians. He came back to Rome, you know, so forth. And so. Okay, we know there was a Rome. We know there was wars. We know this. Okay, we know all these things. It's confirmed on independent sources. Friends, there is more historical evidence for the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ than Julius Caesar ever existed. And sure, you might want to say, well, we don't know anything about history. We can't believe anything in history. Fine. If you're going to say that, then say it consistently. But if we know anything from history, we know Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Friends, through the years have been many objections suggested to the resurrection of Jesus. Some say that Jesus didn't die at all that he just swooned on the cross, and then he revived in the tomb. 
You gotta be kidding. <laughs> I described to you what a crucifixion was like, right? Friends, that's no walk in the park. So they're saying that Jesus kind of passed out on the cross. They took him down and somehow the cool air of the tomb revived him. So what he did was he kind of hopped up off the ledge and caught the quarter of his uh, grave clothes on a sharp rock and jumped around and untwisted them. Then he, from the inside, rolled away the stone and did some of the most impressive Bruce Lee Kung Fu stuff you've ever seen in his life to take out the detachment of Roman guards that was standing right outside his, his tomb. And for, you start believing that, my friends, that takes way more faith than believing what the simple message of the Bible is. Other people say that he really died, but his body was stolen. Right. So it was all just a big plot, a cover-up by the disciples. That's what it was, right? They stole Jesus' body. They didn't want to lose face. So they stole it and they said, look, let's just say he rose from the dead. We'll bury him somewhere. Nobody will know. We'll just say he rose from the dead. It'll be our little gag, our little trick on the world. And so every one of them went to their death for a joke, for a little gag on the world. No, my friends, a joke, a cover-up, a falsity doesn't transform the world like this. Other people say that Jesus really died, but his desperate followers hallucinated his resurrection. I don't know where people get these ideas. Yeah, 500 people at once hallucinated his resurrection? I don't think so. Friends, a plain, simple understanding of what the Bible says about the resurrected Jesus makes us conclude that he rose from the dead. Charles Spurgeon said, I suppose, brethren, that we may have persons arise who will doubt whether or there ever was such a man as Julius Caesar or Napoleon Bonaparte. And when they do, when all reliable history is flung to the winds, then, but not till then, may they begin to question whether Jesus Christ rose from the dead. For this historical fact is attested by more witnesses than almost any other fact that stands on record in history, whether sacred or secular. He rose from the dead, friends. And if you notice here, verse 7, after that he was seen by James and then by all the apostles. I think it's interesting that he mentions that he was seen by James. This would be James, the brother of Jesus. Apparently, uh, Jesus had his own personal resurrection appearance to his brother. Now, all throughout Jesus' ministry on this earth, James, Jesus' brother, and all of Jesus' brother, none of them believed in him. How would you like to have Jesus be your older brother? Oh, man. Talk about some sibling rivalry there. You imagine what mom would say? Why can't you be like Jesus? He never does anything wrong. I don't blame Jesus' brothers for being sore at him. They didn't believe in him during all of his life. Well, my friends, but something happened. When the resurrected Jesus appeared to James, I, well, first of all, I said, I think Jesus just came before him in the glory of his resurrection and said to James, wait, do you doubt me now? I don't know what he said, but whatever he said, James, man, boom, it was over. Acts chapter one, when they're gathered together at the day of Pentecost, James is there and he's a believer. So he was probably converted at this post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. And then he also mentions other meetings of all the apostles. And then in verse 8, he says, Last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. You know, Paul says, I, I had a weird spiritual birth. I wasn't birthed like the other apostles. They sort of had a three-year gestation period in their birth, right? They were carried around with Jesus. Paul says, not me. I'm different. So friends, notice all the people who saw Jesus Cephas, the twelve, five hundred, James, the apostles as a whole, and then Paul, finally. And the cumulative testimony of these witnesses is overwhelming. Not only did they see Jesus after his death, but they saw him in a manner which revolutionized their faith and trust in him. Friends, maybe the greatest evidence for the, resurre for the resurrection is the changed character of the apostles and their willingness to die for the testimony of the resurrection. This eliminates fraud as an explanation of the empty tomb. Now, before we go on to verse 11 or verse 9, I should say, let me say one other thing here about this. Did you notice who Paul did not mention? 
Who were the first people to see the resurrected Jesus? The women. And Paul doesn't mention them as witnesses. Do you know why? Because in that day, in both the Greek and in the Jewish world, the testimony of women was not accepted in a court of law. It was deemed unreliable. They just said, well, you know, we can't be listening to silly women. That's what they said in that day. Now, I want you to notice, God did not agree with that opinion because he made women the first witnesses of the resurrection. And God thought that they, that the women were extremely able and capable of being the first preachers of the risen Lord to the apostles themselves. The apostles didn't believe when the women had already believed. But that's why Paul doesn't mention the testimony of women here, because he knew that his audience wouldn't relate to it. Verse 9. And you see, these thoughts of Paul's apostleship make him think about his own apostleship. And so he goes on here and he says, For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it is I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Oh, you know, I got a lot of favorite passages of Scripture. And this is one of them. Notice how Paul begins. He says, I'm the least of the apostles. I think this is interesting because in other passages, Paul argues very hard for his apostolic credentials. He says, listen, he says, you call me not an apostle? Paul says, I'll tell you I'm an apostle. And when I come, I'm going to show you I'm an apostle. And I'm going to really stir things up when I'm there with you. But at the same time, Paul had no desire to compete with the other apostles for that most valuable apostle award that they handed out every year. Paul said, you know what? I am an apostle, but I'm the least of the apostles. Matter of fact, Paul believed that he was not even worthy to be called an apostle. Now, for some people, this would just be spiritual sounding talk that showed more pride than humility. Oh, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. Tell me I am. Tell me I am. You know, that's kind of the thought there, right? But that's not how it was with Paul. Paul meant it. Do you know why Paul meant it? Because he said, I persecuted the church of God. Paul always remembered how he had sinned against Jesus' church. He knew that he was forgiven, yet he remembered the sin. He said, that makes me not even worthy to be called an apostle. But notice what he says here, verse 9, or verse 10. He says, but, he says, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle, but... By the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul gave the grace of God all the credit for the change in his life. Paul was a changed man. He was forgiven. He was cleansed. He was full of love when once he was full of hate. And Paul knew that this was not his own accomplishment, but it was the work of the grace of God within him. Now, friends, let me just point this out, that the grace that saves us changes us. Grace changed Paul. You cannot receive the grace of God without being changed by it. Now, the changes don't all come at once, and the changes aren't going to be finished until we are resurrected ourselves. But friends, we are indeed changed by the grace of God when it comes into our life. And friends, the grace of God changes us. But please notice this. Paul goes on to say, and this is so important. Please, if you're not listening much to anything with what the scripture is saying tonight, listen to this in verse 10. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. And friends, Paul knew that it was the grace of God that made him what he was, right? At the same time, Paul said, I worked with God's grace so that it would not be given in vain. Do you see that? Paul says, I labored, I worked. Conceivably, if Paul had not worked as hard as he did, the grace of God given to him in some measure would have been given in vain. Now, grace by definition is given freely, but how we receive God's grace will help determine how effective God's grace is within us. 
Now, friends, let me point this out. God does not give us His grace because of any works, past, present, or promised. Yet the grace of God is not given to replace our work. It's given to encourage our work. It's not given to say that work isn't necessary. God does not want you to receive His grace and then become passive. Paul knew that God gives His grace, and then we work hard, and then the work of God is done. We work in a partnership with God. Why? Because He needs us? Get serious. God needs us? Come on. No. We work with God because God wants us to share in His work. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, We are God's fellow workers. We're his co-workers. Now, many Christians struggle at this very point. They say things like, is God supposed to do it or am I supposed to do it? You know what I'm getting at? Is God supposed to do it or am I supposed to do it? You know what the answer to that is? Yes. (laughs) Just simply put, yes. God will do it and you do it. Trust in God, rely on Him, and then get to work and work as hard as you can. My friends, that's how you see the work of God accomplished. If I neglect my end of the partnership, God's grace doesn't accomplish all that it might, and therefore it's given in vain. Later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, Paul pleads that we might not receive the grace of God in vain. He says, we then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Matter of fact, I want you to see what Paul says here. Listen, if this man wasn't an apostle of God and demonstrated such incredible humility in other areas of his life, I would think he was the biggest proud freak in the world just based on verse 10. Look at what he says. I labored more abundantly than they all. Do you realize what Paul's saying there? He's saying, I worked harder than any other apostle. Now, friends, in in the, the mouth of a proud man, that's a proud statement. In the mouth of Paul the apostle, he's just telling the facts. He's comparing himself to the other apostles. And Paul's not shy about saying, I worked harder than any of them else. And it wasn't because the other apostles were necessarily lazy, although, you know what, maybe some of them were. I wonder about Bartholomew myself. We don't hear much about him. I don't know. But friends, Paul was an exceptionally hard worker, and that saw more of the work of God get done. I don't know how to put it any other way than this, my friends. But sometimes uh, Christians lose sight of the value of hard work. And if you want God to use you in a mighty way, you better get ready to work hard. If you want to be something great for the Lord and have Him use you, get ready to work hard. You know, sometimes when... Uh, People are blessed through some of the ministry that that God gives through me. And as I look, and, and as I look at what God is doing, I can say, I work hard. Now, I probably don't work maybe as hard as I could or as hard as I should. Sometimes I go back and say, you know what, I, I could have done more. I could have done more. But friends, it doesn't happen by accident. You know, I'll joke around sometimes about, you know, I'll spend all week surfing, playing golf. Friends, I didn't get ready for tonight by going out sitting on the waves. That's for tomorrow. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you want to be used of God, no matter what he puts your heart to, get ready to work hard. And if you're not going to work hard at it, what are you even doing? It's a valid, valid principle. Now notice this, though. Paul knows how to wrap it up perfectly in verse 10. I'm going to read it from the beginning. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Right? We got that. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. 
Paul was honest enough to know that he had worked hard, right? He's not going to stand back and give this falsely spiritual thing. Oh, I didn't do anything. It was only the Lord. No. Paul said, hey, I, not only did I work hard, I worked harder than any of the other apostles. Let me tell you that, Paul says. But at the same time, Paul was humble enough to know that even his hard work was the work of God's grace in him. And that's why he could say it. Now, if you were to ask the Apostle Paul, Paul, do you work hard as an apostle? He would not respond with that falsely spiritual, oh no, I don't do anything. It's all the work of God's grace. Paul would say, you bet I work hard. In fact, I work harder than any other apostle. But you know what? Paul wouldn't dwell on it. Paul wouldn't go around thinking, I work harder. I work harder. He wouldn't go around, you know, they called James Brown the hardest working man in showbiz. He would say, I'm the hardest working man in apostolic ministry. Paul wouldn't go around thinking like that, my friends. But he would simply have the inward knowledge that it was all the work of God's grace within him. So notice the end result here, verse 11. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. You know, whether it was Paul or one of the other apostles who brought the message, the result was the same. What did they preach? They preached the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the early Christians believed the resurrection of Jesus. Matter of fact, the verb tense there for when Paul says, we preach, it's in the continual tense. Paul is saying that he and the other apostles habitually preach the message of the resurrected Jesus. Now, what does it matter? That's what we're getting at in verse 12. And we're going to cover here verses 12 through 19 and wrap it up here for the evening. Paul says now, verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Now, you might be wondering, why has Paul so carefully demonstrated and proven the resurrection of Jesus? And he's done a pretty good job, right? Why? Was it that the Corinthians didn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead? No, they did believe it. Look at verse 11. And so you believed. They believed it. They believed that Jesus Christ rose from the dead in a resurrection body. Then why was it important? Friends, check this out. And you've got to remember this for next week. If I tell you this, you got to come back next week. So if you're not coming back next week, close your ears now. <laughs> no, here's the point. The Corinthian Christians were not denying Jesus' resurrection. They were denying our resurrection. They were influenced either by Greek philosophy or some of the uh, Jewish ways of thinking that we'll get into more next week. But the bottom line was simply this. The Corinthian Christians believed that we lived forever, but not in resurrection bodies. Let's remember something. When we talk about resurrection, we're not talking about merely life after death. Resurrection is the continuation of life after death in glorified bodies, which are our present bodies transformed into a glorified state. That's the Christian teaching of resurrection. That's what some of the Corinthian Christians didn't believe. They weren't doubting Jesus' resurrection. They believed that, but they were doubting ours. And so you notice what Paul, Paul is brilliant. He's getting at this and he goes, okay, now look, I've proven to you that Jesus rose from the dead, right? You believe that, right? 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 And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then he says, well, I've just established to you the principle of resurrection. If you believe the principle of resurrection for Jesus, how come you don't believe it for yourself? The Corinthian Christians were just not thinking carefully. Some of them were denying the reality of the resurrection, but they believed in a resurrected Jesus. Paul says, listen, the resurrected Jesus not only proves his own resurrection, he proves the principle of resurrection. And so he says, look, if nobody rises from the dead, if there is no principle of resurrection, then how do you explain Jesus rising from the dead? I think this is the place where the Corinthian Christians get really red in the face, reading Blair. They go, oh, yeah. But now Paul continues on, verse 14. <laughs> He's not letting up much, folks. And if Christ is not risen, 
then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we are of all men the most pitiable. You know what Paul does in verses 14 through 19? He says, okay, what if? What if there is no resurrection? What if? Well, first of all, if there's no resurrection, Paul says, then our preaching is in vain. No resurrection, then Jesus isn't risen. Then what Paul and the other apostles have been preaching is in vain. There is no real resurrected Jesus whom they're serving. Worse, see that in verse 15? And we are found false witnesses of God. You know what Paul's saying? If there is no resurrection, we're liars. Paul said, you calling us apostles liars? Of course there's a resurrection. Worse yet, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Friends, if there is no principle of resurrection then Jesus did not rise from the dead. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then death has still has its power over him and has defeated him. If death has power over Jesus, then he's not God. If Jesus is not God, then he can't offer a complete sacrifice for sins. If Jesus cannot offer a complete sacrifice for sins, then my sins are not completely paid for before God. If my sins are not completely paid for before God, then I'm still in my sins. If Jesus Christ is not risen from the dead, he's unable to save me. Worse yet, look at verse 18. If Christ is not risen, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Friends, if there is no principle of resurrection, then the dead in Christ are gone forever. Finally, look at it in verse 19. If Christ is not risen, then in this life only we have hope in Christ. We are of all men the most pitiable. Friends, if there is no principle of resurrection, then the whole Christian life is a pitiable joke. If we don't have something to look forward to beyond this life, then why hassle with the problems of being a Christian? Now look, can we get honest here? It's true that being a Christian solves many problems in your life, right? But it also brings a lot of problems in your life, doesn't it? You bet it does. And if there is not a life beyond this one that sets it straight, what good is it? It's true that knowing Jesus and loving Jesus can make this life better, but sometimes it makes this life worse. When we appreciate some of the hardship Paul lived with, when we understand what he means, when he writes, he goes, listen, man, if this all there is, then I'm nuts. Then you should pity me as a fool. Paul thought, with all I've endured for Jesus Christ, if there's not a resurrection, if there's not a heavenly reward beyond this life, I'm a fool to be pitied. Now, what makes me afraid is I wonder if in our own super comfortable age, if we can say the same thing. I want you to notice this too. Paul only applies this principle to Christians. He writes, we are of all men the most pitiable. Friends, for the unbeliever, this life alone gives them the only shot of pleasure they will ever have. Whatever happiness they can find now is the only happiness they will ever have throughout all of eternity. But not for the believer. No way. So friends, see how important the truth of the resurrection is? This is not some side doctrine to be believed if someone likes it. If you do not believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead in a resurrection body the way the Bible says he did... You have no right to call yourself a Christian. This is one of the essential doctrines of the Christian faith. Martin Luther said, everything depends on our retaining a firm hold on this doctrine in particular. For if this one totters and no longer counts, all the others will lose their value and validity. 
Friends, Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures. And next week, we're going to talk a lot more about our resurrection, because that's what Paul's going to get into. Father, we look forward to that heavenly hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We ask now, Lord, that you would allow to rise within us the spirit of praise and worship unto you, so that you would be praised and honored and glorified. We want to worship a risen Savior. And Lord, we thank you that you live inside of our heart. But Lord, we know that uh, even at the times when we don't feel you there, you're still risen. You're still glorified. We know it for a fact, Lord. We don't have to rely on it as a feeling. And so we rejoice in that together tonight, Lord. Help us to enter in and to worship you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.